happy to see uh, everyone uh, here today. And I'm also happy to welcome uh, today's LTEC speaker, uh, Eddie Vafay from uh, Haifa University. Um, Eddie graduated at uh, Ben Gurion University, where he was uh, also proceeded to pursue his PhD in the lab of uh, Mikhail Butnik. And uh, between 1992 and 94, he was a postdoc in the Department of Psychology at uh, Harvard University in the lab of uh, Michael Hasselhoff. And he was working there on neuromodulation of activity-dependent plasticity in the cortex. And in 1997, he uh, returned to Israel to begin uh, his lab here at uh, Ben Gurion University, uh, where he further elaborated his line of research on plasticity and olfactory uh, learning in the peripheral cortex. And in 2003, he moved to the Department of Biology uh, at Haifa University, uh, extending his work also into other areas related to uh, plasticity and learning, such as the campus and frontal cortex. And he's now Dean of the Faculty of Biology at Haifa University. And I'm very happy and uh, eager to listen to his talk about learning dysmodulation of intrinsic neural uh, ability, mechanism, and functional significance. So thank you, Ishai, for inviting me. What I would like to discuss with you today is a story which has been folding in our uh, lab for the last uh, 15 years or so. And it, it would describe you a mechanism of learning and memory in the mammalian brain. Usually, when we say memory, you think immediately on Hep's law, about Hep's law. You think about changes in uh, strength of synaptic connections, and you assume that this is how the engram is stored. It should be noted, however, that if you think about all the models that you recognize on the biological basis of learning and memory, it's always very simple forms of learning. If you think of Kandel's work, Elkon's work, Elkon's work, Thompson's work, Ledoux's work, it's always classical conditioning or habituation or sensitization. What I would like to discuss with you today is a mechanism of higher form of learning such that we term rule learning or learning set is when you learn how to learn is that particular learning that makes you a smarter organism. And what I will describe you today is the several unique characteristics that this form of learning has, which differ quite a lot from what I have postulated. First of all, it is acquired with great effort. The second is that non synaptic biophysical modification has a key role in such learning. Such learning also involves long lasting modification in most of the neurons in the relevant neuronal network. So it's not only a few synapses that change, rather, the whole network enters into a new state. And further, I will describe to you our work and uh, aim to find the molecular basis of this learning and hopefully I'll be able to convince you that we can actually focus down on one single molecule that if you modify its activity would enable us to modify the whole learning capability of the organism. So I will start by the learning that we've been using. This learning paradigm which is based on the olfactory system has been developed in the 80s at Arvine by Ursula Stabli, Gary Lynch, and your colleagues. The idea here is to impose on the rat to learn something using only its olfactory modality. So, we use a forearm, our maze. The rat is positioned in the center of the maze, facing four closed doors. When the trial begins, two of the arms are chosen randomly by a computer, and two others are streamed from the uh, end of the arms. It's about one meter long, and the rat has to learn that he has to run to the arm which deployed the correct odor, and then he'll get rewarded with drinking water at the end. Half cc of drinking water in the end. These rats are thirsty, they're water deprived, so they're motivated to find uh, water. If they choose the correct odor in 10 seconds, they get rewarded. If they choose the wrong odor, there's no punishment. They just don't get rewarded with drinking water. If they don't make a choice in 10 seconds, it's considered to be a failure. The trial ends, the rat is put back on the center of the maze, the, the rows are closed, a ventilator cleans the air, and a new trial begins. Again, two, two arms are chosen randomly by the computer. So this ensures that there's no spatial learning here. The only information that the rat has 
is that an odor may be connected to a water reward. Rats are usually extremely good with odors. They run it like that, but not this task. This task, if you try 20 trials per day, and you define success as making 80% correct choices in the last 10 trials of a day, remember, 50% is chance. Yes. Okay. 50% is chance. So they, they have to show just some improvement. And if you train them 20 times a day, it will take them five days to show any improvement. You can see here the pseudo training group, which is basically getting the same treatment, but uh, is rewarded randomly, so they have no reason to memorize the others from a human point of view, and they indeed keep 50% uh, correct choices. On the sixth day, the trained rats start showing some understanding of what's going on, and they reach the criteria in seven to eight days. So it's about 140 to 160 trials to make them realize what you expect of them, and then they understand what they have to do. But once they do, and now you expose them to a second pair or third pair of orders, they'll do it immediately. So it's not that you just learned that a particular order is connected with a particular reward. They understand the task. They know what has to be done now. And this phase where they improve dramatically their learning capability is what we term rule learning or learning set. And the cellular modifications, which I'll show you today, appear after the first pair of others, or maybe you can do the second just to make sure that they have learned uh, the paradigm, but you don't need to train them. You can actually keep training them, they'll learn dozens of others, and they won't forget them. But you can see extremely robust changes after you've reached the phase of rule learning. So, what we did next is record intrinsic neural properties in brain slices. And you can see here the brain of a red. This is the hippocampus. We'll be back to it uh, afterwards. This is the basilar amygdala, which also shows some difference. But this is the area which we'll concentrate on. This is the pure from cortex. Yes? So, in the previous slide, how much is the variability between different uh, individuals? So, do some rats get it faster? Or? Yes, some rats do get it faster. So, some could do it in six days, some could do it in eight days. That doesn't mean that they're smarter. Some of them are just shy. Some of them are more adventurous. They have personalities. So some of them will do it faster. I'm not sure it's because they're smarter. But it's very rare to find a rat that will do it in less than six days. And almost none of them take 10 days. So it's pretty narrow. Is this the, is this the limitation uh, independent of the particular size, particular kind of order? Yes. We have purchased 15 years ago 100 others from other companies. So basically, this is orange, lemon, peach. Uh, they're not aversive to the rest. You know that they're not aversive because the pseudo trend nets keep going there. Yeah, but maybe they are uh, belong to a single class, like fruit, order, or something like that. I don't think it, it's not a problem of distinction. It's a very strong order. Uh, humans actually could, could tell the difference. No, no, I, We never did that uh, systematically. We just use about 20 to 30 orders. We didn't see a difference, but we didn't do this all this all, all this fancy psychophysics. We never got it. Like meat order versus meat order or something like that. Uh, actually, we don't have meat order, but <laughs> just kinds of fruits. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So this is what you see here is the piriform cortex. The piriform cortex is an old cortex. It has only three layers. And what you see here, the very heavy labored layer, it's the cell bodies of pyramidal neuron in layer two. So this is where you go and you record. This is pyramidal, pyramidal neurons. This is how they look after Golgi staining, like most pyramidal neurons that you see in the brain, a pyramidal cell body, an apical dendrite, and a few basal dendrites. And what we do is we penetrate them with a sharp electrode. Most of you which are doing a uh, recording of single cells would do it with special electrode. This is a sharp electrode. 
Batch clamp electrodes are great if you want to study uh, synaptic potentials. But if you want to study intrinsic properties of neurons, sharp electrodes would probably be better because you don't get a washout of the uh, internal channels. At any rate, we penetrate the cells. Of course, you can't see them because we do it on brain slices, so they're not fixed. You penetrate with the cells, and with the cell, you can inject current and measure the response. So basically, you can study the input-output function of these neurons and see how they differ. So what you do is you train rats. You make sure that they've learned the rule, and now you start preparing slices. And you can do it at different times after learning. Now let's take a look what happens if you do it one, two, three days after learning. First, you measure the basic properties of the neurons. And you don't have to read this table because this trait doesn't differ. Resting potential, input resistance, remember time constant, spike width, spike amplitude, all these very basic traits are not modified by learning as you expect them because the brain still has to function as it did before. What does change? What does change is the dynamic response of the cell. How would you measure that? You penetrate the cell and you give a one second long pulse and you start increasing the pulse intensity until you get a spike. And this is a threshold. And now you double the intensity to be exactly double of the threshold and then you have this train of spikes. Now there's a trait called adaptation that most neurons have it, especially uh, pyramidal neurons, where the firing rate is fastest at the beginning and then it slows down and sometimes it disappears. And this is mostly because of late potassium current which develop with the polarization, uh, but not only. What we see here is the rate of adaptation. And here is the firing frequency normalized to the uh, first two spikes. And you can see here that the firing frequency is less adapting in neurons from trend red. The curve is less steep, meaning they would be able to sustain more firing. And if you compare here the pseudo trade and the naive reds, you can see that they both differ significantly from the trained group, starting from the fifth or sixth interspike interval. So it's a late current, and it can really strongly affect the uh, firing properties of the neuron, dynamic response of the uh, neuron. So the primary suspect would be a potassium current for that. How would you go about and measure this potassium current? Well, you can depolarize the cell to minus 60 millivolt and with DC current. And on top of that, you add a 100 millisecond pulse that would generate exactly six action potential. That's your standard measure. And when you do that, you get a voltage deflection after the burst. And this negative voltage connection is called post-burst after hyperpolarization. Post-burst because you need a burst of spikes to get it. And if you measure this post-burst HP, which presumably reflects potassium conductance, you can see that it's being reduced after learning. We've been doing it for about 14 to 15 years, always 10% reduction. It's a very reliable result. So now it would be very tempting to assume that there is less potassium conductance. Which neurons are these? Layer 2 pyramidal neurons. It's very tempting just to assume that maybe the potassium conductance is reduced. But actually, you could figure that maybe there is a positive current. And that's why you get reduction in the HP. <coughs> so the way to determine that is to try to see what is the reversal potential of the HP, much as you would do with synaptic potentials. You record it at different membrane potentials, and then you draw this curve that will tell you the amplitude of the HP as a function of the mem membrane potential. And if you do that, you can see that the difference between the trend and the pseudo trend is not in the reversal potential. It's exactly on the same point. This line is a summary of all the data that we have. And you can see that it's not a new mixture of currents, but the slope in the trend neurons is less steep, which means there is less conductance. Actually, there's change in the slope is exactly the same 10% which you see in the amplitude when you record at minus 60 millivolts. I keep repeating the conditions because unlike people that do plasticity in slices, the dual TP, you don't have the cell before and after. You have it only once. 
So you have to compare between groups. So the conditions have to be standard all the time. So what we can see here is that the reduction in some kind of presumably potassium current. And what you can see here is a cumulative frequency graph of the amplitudes of the neurons from the train and from the pseudo train red. Actually, the naive group is very much like the pseudo. And you can see here the reduction in the average HP amplitude does not occur because a few cells almost lose their HP. On the contrary, the whole curve is shifted to the left, maybe except for this 3% of cells, maybe. So it's a population effect. All HPs are somewhat reduced. You can see it almost in all the neurons that you record in this particular brain area. So it's a correlation. It's always a problem in biology when to assume some kind of mechanistic relation to behavior. There's a lot of correlation, but it's hard to show causality. And I still am not showing you causality, but I'll show you another correlation. I just told you that when the animal learns the rule, then the HP is reduced. Now, let's see for how long it, it is reduced. And it appears from cortex, once you stop training, it would get back to the initial value within three days. And here you can see the comparison to the pseudo. You see a nice response on the first day, on the third day. And if you wait some more, it bounces back to the initial value. Now, let's try to see the mirror experiment in training the animals. So if you wait with the second order, one or three days, the animals will learn immediately. But if you wait for longer, when the HP resumes its initial value, then the animals wouldn't learn as well as they did before. They still learn more than chance, because there are also synaptic uh, chances involved, which I will not discuss today. But the point is that the correlation holds when you're going back from single cell recordings to behavior. You learn the HP is reduced. The HP returns to its initial value. Then the animals wouldn't learn as well. OK. Through the years, yes? So when you say it doesn't learn as well, as opposed to the roughly eight days before, like how many days does it? Does, does it last? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, how many days does it take for it to get to the 80% level? The 80% level, I'll tell you, seven to eight days. Again, seven days. Yes. Oh, w once you trade them again? Yeah. So after the HP gets. Uh, That's interesting on what orders you train them, but, but they'll learn it faster if you do that. They'll learn it faster in a few days. So through the years, we've examined a few brain areas which are involved in this olfactory learning. So you can see here the result I showing you the pure from cortex, and you have the reduction on the first day after learning. In the hippocampus, it would actually get reduced earlier, but would disappear earlier. And in the basilar amygdala, it would be reduced just one day after learning. So this is the crucial point where large parts of the brain are changed. And you can see here that what I've shown you for the piriform is true for the other parts too. So imagine millions of neurons, millions and millions of neurons, all becoming more excitable at one point in time. I'll be back to the hippocampus later. But for now, I try to show you what is changing in these neurons. Why do they fire more action potential? First of all, Maybe it's a calcium potassium dependent potassium current, which is the natural candidate. So what you do, you apply BAPTA to your recording electrodes. So you record the firing of these neurons, and then you inject the BAPTA, and you see that the firing frequency is higher. You can see they're adapt less. And this was well known, of course, when we started doing it. Been known for decades. If you repeat now the experiment in trained neurons, you don't get any effect. So now you can block calcium, you wouldn't get a change in the frequency of firing. And in BAPTA, they actually become the same. And also the HP, post-burst HP, is also similar in BAPTA. So we think that what has been reduced is the calcium-dependent potassium current. Which current? There are two good candidates, the slow IHP and the IHP. These are two uh, calcium-dependent potassium currents which affect repetitive firing. 
the slow HP is slower, takes more time to develop, also lasts for longer, and is affected differently by different neuromodulators. Actually, it's an extremely interesting uh, current. Unfortunately, we don't have a good blocker for him. We have a good blocker only for the IHP. And you can see here a response in a cell which looks pretty nice because there's fast AHP, which reduces the action potential. This is the Hodgkin-Huxley current that you all know. There's a medium after hyperpolarization, which is mediated by the IHP, and there's a late uh, AHP, which is mediated by the slow IHP. So when you pair up a mean, it blocks only the medium AHP. And you can see here that it blocks only medium AHP. It doesn't affect the late AHP. But this is only in 20% of the neurons. In most neurons, the currents overlap, the slow and the uh, medium HP, so you just have to subtract uh, before and after uh, application. And what you can see here is that you can now calculate the slow HP portion of the HP. You just subtract the IHP portion, which is just blocked, from the total. And you can see here that the slow IHP portion is actually bigger. The difference is bigger after learning. And if you just now calculate the IHP, you can see that it's the same in all groups. So what has been reduced is only the slow IHP current. Only this very slow, very interesting, actually it has much, much less conductance than the BK channels that you know that would dominate the action potential. Yeah. When you go into the mechanism, is there a correlate with the Okay, so let's first answer the first question. If you record XSLR, you just get the response of the neurons in the network. You don't know if it's intrinsic or synaptic. Actually, most people that record single unit recordings in the piriform cortex, they and see a modification, they claim that it's synaptic because they never think about intrinsic properties. But it's a mixture, so you, you can't tell. You can't tell until you measure the biophysics of the cell. You do see, you do see a change, but, but you're not sure what it represents. That's fine. Does this have an impact for the real animal in real life? Do every neuron have the dominant neuron? Right. Does it have a higher firing rate than the cell? Pyramidal neurons, at least, yeah. They do that. Yes. Do you have evidence for this? Or? That it happens in vivo? Yeah. I have strong evidence to show that once you prevent it, it wouldn't hurt, the animal wouldn't learn, and once you activate it, the animal would learn faster. Right. Because the whole brain is more active. Right. Yes. I would try to discuss later the significance of that. And is this good for learning? Yes, apparently it is good for learning. So that's only for the learning phase, or is it something that, uh, I mean, it, it could decay, right? It's, uh, it decays. <coughs> so what, what time scale do you A few days. In the piriform cortex, few days. In the hippocampus, once you have learned the rule in the Bartolata Mictana, once you have learned the significance. It depends. Yes, please. What, what, do you find any differences in this context class, different learning class? You do. You do. Or or yes, you do. You do. You do. Uh, if you keep, allow the rats to learn something else, is it the same thing? People have shown some similar effects. We can show that if you teach them an aversive olfactory task, you'll get other changes in the amygdala. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to discuss this today. I won't, have, I won't show that uh, we're done this today. But yes, the principle holds, but there are some changes. OK. So it's been reduced for three days. How is it maintained? We've checked the second messenger systems that are known to be important for learning. So one of them is the ERC system. And when you block ERC in a controlled pseudo rate, you get nothing. But if you block it in the uh, trained rate, you get an increase in the HP. And you can see that the difference in HP is disappearing when you block ERC activity. So remember, this is for three days. Most biochemists don't really approve 
who is brought in being phosphorylated for so long, but they do. So it's there. It's persistent activation of ERK. Also persistent activation. And also you can see here that you get the same thing in the firing frequency. This is the reduction in the chain, and you can see the others. The same is for PKC. If you block PKC, you get an increase in the HP only in the chain group. So the difference disappears. If you do now the mirror experiment and you activate PKC, you get a reduction of the two control groups to the train group. So this is a PKC dependent phenomena. You can see it both ways. And we can also show that PKC is upstream to ERK because once you block ERK, if you activate this PKC, you don't get a difference. So that's great. You have the second messenger system. They're very important. But how would it affect, how would it affect actual learning? Well, one neuromodulator, which is known to affect the slow IHP, is acetylcholine, and it does so also by activating PKC and ERK. So, we now examined whether the response of these neurons to acetylcholine would differ after learning. So, if you apply carbocol to a normal cell, again, it was known since the 80s, you get increased firing, you can see a strong increase in this neuron, particular neuron, and also you can see the total result. You get a reduction in the uh, adaptation. It was well known when we started doing it. But now if we repeat it in a trend neuron, you get nothing. It's as if there is a saturation of the effect of acetylcholine on the cell. And actually, in carbocol, the difference disappears in the firing frequency and in the AHP. Acetylcholine is important for learning. You can block it or you can activate it and you can see the effect on the animal. So this gives us a golden opportunity to get some prediction. What I described to you now is going from the behavior to a single cell level or molecular level, which is great, but this is only correlation. If you want to argue that whatever you see on the single cell or molecular level actually relates to learning, you have to come with some sorts of prediction. And this result gave us a good uh, prediction, we thought. Since you're all visual animals, hopefully you read the prediction while I was talking. And the idea here is very simple. If acetylcholine can enhance firing frequency in a normal uh, red, but it loses the ability to increase firing frequency after training, and increased firing frequency has to do something with learning capability, then once you apply a still call light to a rat that has learned the rule, it shouldn't affect him. It should affect the rat that hasn't learned. <coughs> but if you block a still call line in a trained rat, it shouldn't affect his learning ability. And that's the result of the experiment. When you train for the first pair of orders, and you block acetylcholine, you take them almost, almost twice to learn. You never block learning altogether. You have to block also an MDA to, to do that. And then also they'll eventually learn. But you very, see a very strong effect on the learning capability. But once they've acquired the rule, you can continue blocking it. It would have no, no consequence on the learning capability. So remember, these are reds that are learning, and acetylcholine is blocked. They can still learn. OK. I've shown you that we think we know how it is maintained, but how? Yes. Uh, so there's a question about what you mean by learning. So does this be true if you learn with the rat figuring out what the task is supposed to do with? Right. And number two is uh, the rat being able to discriminate the two orders, which, which sounds like an olfactory, uh, uh, more of an olfactory thing. I would argue that there is no issue of ability to and discriminate between the orders. These are very strong orders at high concentrations. Rats do it immediately. If you try a simple test with the same orders, they'll do it immediately. So it's the first one. Yes. <coughs> it's the context in which they have to learn it. It's not about olfaction. So how is it induced? Which is not a trivial question to ask because it's of course why they're learning. So how will you get the right moment? <coughs> Luckily, there was a group headed 
by Barry Lancaster, I think it was at Cambridge at the time, and he has shown that if you apply Kynet to the cells, the HP would be reduced. They were not static learning. They were actually trying to find a cure for epilepsy. But we adopted the result, and what you can see here, us repeating the result that we did in the hippocampus in the piriform cortex. So you can record the amplitude of the HP every 10 seconds much as you would do when you're trying to do LTP, and then you apply kinase for 10 seconds, and then you have a reduction in the AHP. And they have shown that we repeated the experiment. When you repeat it in neurons from trained rats, basically you get nothing. You get no additive effect. And again here, the difference disappears when you apply kinet. <coughs> so because learning occludes kinet induced uh, reduction in the HP, one can assume that maybe it's the same mechanism. There's also another way to do it. You can stimulate repetitively. Actually, you can simulate at a frequency which is less than required for LTP induction. And when you do that, again, it's just repeating their experiment 50 hertz, 20 times, you get a reduction in the HP. Note that there's some difference here. Uh, there's some delay here. You get a reduction. And then you get nothing when you do it in a trained rate. Again, the difference disappears. And you can also abolish this with the same blocker that you could uh, abolish the difference between chain and uh, pseudo chain. If you apply a PKC activator, you get a reduction of the HP, and then you cannot reduce it anymore with synaptic stimulation. And also, when you uh, activate, then you get a an increase, and it doesn't matter if you stimulate anymore. So it's basically the same second messenger systems that maintain <coughs> the reduced HP for days are those which are responsible for the reduction to begin with. So we usually think of long-term memory as being dependent on protein synthesis. And we also wanted to examine whether this is the case here, which is not trivial because you can stimulate the cell, but you cannot record it for three to four hours because the cell just wouldn't hold with a sharp electron delay. So what we did, and this is actually in C1, we placed an extracellular electrode, we repeated, stimulated repeatedly, and we just looked at CA1 neurons, then we stimulated the collaterals. We just looked that indeed you have a response. That is just a field potential response to make sure that the synapses are activated. And then subsequently, we recorded the AHP hours after the stimulation. And what you see here, that if you stimulate and you record hours after the stimulation, you get a reduced AHP. You can see here. And here you can see the dependence in time. Actually, you see it almost in all neurons. The HP is reduced if you stimulate the area. Is it a protein synthesis dependent phenomena? Well, you can block protein synthesis with anomycin D. And if you do that until one hour after stimulation, you don't get a reduction in the post-burst HP. If you wait longer than an hour, you get a nice reduction. So in this manner, it is very similar to late LTP. If you want the phenomena to hold for more than a few hours, you have to activate the uh, nucleus. <coughs> OK. I would like now to argue that we can actually show the precise mechanism, the precise molecule by which you can achieve such a reduction. And again, we rely on the work done by a group at the NIH. They were again looking for something else. But they have shown that if you take GLUR6 knockout out mice, there are several kind of receptors, GLUR6, GLUR7, GLUR8, I'm sorry, GLUR5, 6, and 7. And they've shown that if you knock out only the GLUR6, you do not get a reduction in the HP in response to repetitive stimulation. It's fine with GLUR6 and GLUR5 knockouts, but only the GLUR6 cannot reduce the HP in response to repetitive stimulation. So we thought maybe learning is somehow involved with activation of GLUR6. So we came up with the following model. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. We came with this model. The model states that you have this membrane and you have this cell, and we inject 
Carnage to the cell, you get this response. This is a typical response. Fast firing in the beginning, then slower, and then it stops. So the idea is that when the animal learns and glutamate is secreted, it would activate the glur receptors, which would then activate this chain of second messengers, which will eventually result in block of the slow HP channel. By the way, it's surprising, but nobody identified the channel yet. Nobody knows which channel mediates the slow HP. And then when you inject current, the cell would fire like that. So we go from this firing state to this firing state. I did think about millions of cells going from that state to that state. Of course, this is not a cell before and after learning. I cannot do that. This is a cell before and after acetylcholine, coli, just for demonstration. So that's a great theory, but somebody has to prove it. And what would be a good way to prove it? Well, you can come out with really tough predictions. So the first obvious prediction would be that when GLUR6 <coughs> receptors are blocked, the animal should not be able to learn the rule. It shouldn't affect the simple learning. But true learning, if it's indeed dependent on AHP reduction, then if you block it, then the animal shouldn't learn. And if you somehow can activate GLUR6, then it should learn faster. So these are two quite strong predictions. And if they're proven correct, they would sort of take us on the pathway to causal, causal uh, relations between the HP and learning. So let's first examine the first prediction. And this has been done with our colleague Dietmar Schmidt from Berlin. And Dietmar gave us these QR6 <coughs> knockouts. And you can see here that they cannot learn the task. This is the learning co curve of the normal mice. Notice that it takes quite a lot of time for them to learn because the task was built for rats. Mice are not very good at tasks that were made for rats because they have a whole different way of looking at the world. But eventually they'll learn. And you can see that 80% of them have learned. None, or just one, because there's always one which has to do it. But in general, the glue R6 knockouts remain a chance level even after 20 days of turning training. What happens if you just try a simple test, just to make sure that they're not dumb or that they can't smell or something like that? So there's something which is called the cookie test, which is a very simple test which you have to find a cookie based on the other, and they'll do it exactly like the normal rats. So it's not an issue of being able to smell or motivation or motor or something like that. It has to be something with the neural level. If you now record from these neurons and you apply kinate, you can see that in normal rats, you get an increase in the firing frequency, as I've shown you for rats, and you get nothing in the uh, knockout. Now let's do the other experiments. It's more difficult to do, and actually to me, it's actually more persuasive. Let's see if what happens if we apply an agonist for glor 6 So it appears to be there's such an agonist. It's called Omo Ampa. It took quite time to find him, but we found him. And unfortunately, it doesn't cross the bed blind barrier, so you have to inject it to the ventricles. And if you do, you can see that these animals learn faster. They actually complete learning in four to five days, whereas the cell injected rats take them the same eight days. And you can see here the difference. Again, the, the experiment is not simple. It makes the animal vegetated. It obviously has some side effects. But these are the four rats which agreed to run in the maze afterwards. And in these four rats, uh, you can see that they learn significantly faster. We tried another approach. Using a lentivirus, we overexpressed GRUR6 in the hippocampus. And you can see here the pyramidal neurons in the hippocampus. Again, for now, we have only four rats. And you can see here that they learn the complete learning in six days. And actually, what I've shown you here, it's not as impressive as the Homo Ampa. I guess we should ourselves uh, get better at that. But just the four first rats that we tried have learned faster. And you can see here the comparison of the learning curve, which means and what percentage of rats completed learning in a few days? And you can see here the difference between the Ford virus expressing rats and the normal rats. 
So as far as we can tell, and again, we need to do more experiments of bones on both techniques, as far as we can tell for now, if you can activate DRSS, DRS 6 or of express it, you get a smarter rest. Okay, so finally, I would like to discuss with you, and I think it would answer many questions, the kernel function better, this task better. But I've just shown you that it changes in the hippocampus and it changes in the amygdala. So are these rats smarter? <coughs> Is that there a general enhancement of learning capabilities? And for that, let's get back to the hippocampus. You go to the hippocampus and then you record the after evaluation at different days during and after learning. And you can see here that the HP is actually reduced before it, it gets reduced to the hippocampus. You can see here that they get better only on the sixth day, but you can see a reduction before the HP is reduced. And another interesting thing is that once they have learned the task, the HP in the hippocampus resumes its initial, initial value. It's as if the hippocampus has got something to do only with the rule. Once they've learned the rule, it will go back. You can keep on training. If you keep training rats with 50 odors, the HP will be remain reduced for three days after the last training session. May it be two months after they have learned the rule. Not in the hippocampus. Once the rule is established, the hippocampus would go back to its initial value. But there's a three days period in which you have reduced HP in CA1 area in the hippocampus. Now, remember, the hippocampus has got to do with many learning tasks. Actually, all the tasks which involve declarative memory or understanding has to do something with the hippocampus. So this gives, again, a chance for a very strong prediction because I just told you the hippocampus is changing all over, all pyramid neurons in CA1. Then if you teach them another task which has to do with the hippocampus, this strong effect, actually stronger in the piriform. This is the firing frequency in a pseudo trained rat. This is in a trend, and you can see actually the difference is higher in the hippocampus. It's more pronounced. They fire really much, much more spikes. Then the prediction would be that once you train them in your factory maze, there's a period of time, period of time in which they should learn any other hippocampus dependent task. <coughs> the one that you're familiar with is the Morris Water Maze. I guess everyone is familiar with this. This doesn't need to be described, right? Everyone knows it. The idea is that you put a rat on a swimming pool. The water are cold, so he looks for a plate which is hidden, and he finds a way to get to it just by chance. And then after a few days, no matter where you put it, just based on cues in the room, you can swim to it immediately. Now let's look what happens if you take rats during the time where the HP is reduced. This is after the fifth, days of, fifth day of learning when the HP is reduced. You can see here that they'll perform better this Morris Water may start. Again, they were never exposed to it. They never saw it. It has got nothing to do at all with the olfactory maze. This was a dry maze with olfaction. This is a wet maze with no olfaction. And they would still do it better. Notice this is after the night sleep. They'll just perform better. So they did show a capability of just learning better. We can actually show it now on a middle dependent task, but I wouldn't bother you with this. The second side of the coin would be that if you wait for the HP to return to its initial value, then they should lose their advantage, right? Because it depends on the HP reduction. And these are the results of this experiment. If you wait for enough time for the HP to resume its initial value, they'll lose their advantage. Okay? It's there. They're smarter for as long as the HP is reduced throughout the COM population of the, for, of the uh, hippocampus. So let me summarize by saying that hopefully we've been able to show the true learning is enabled by long-lasting enhancement of intrinsic accessibility, <coughs> which is widely spread throughout the relevant neural networks, that it's related to enhanced learning capability, not to specific learning of others, 
that if it's induced by a GLUR6 mediated block of the slow HP calcium dependent potassium current. So we feel that at this time we identify the molecular mechanism that enables that physical modulation that enables the behavioral change. And the HP reduction is maintained by persistent activation of second messenger system and is dependent at some point on protein synthesis. And what I would like to claim, answering 20 minutes later at this question, that what really happens is when the HP is reduced, now think about all these cells. They're firing more. They adapt less. These are millions of neurons. So what I would like to suggest is when this happens, the brain enters into something which we call learning mode. They all fire more, and they're all, when I, they're activated together, just by HEP flow, they're more prone to change their synaptic connectivity, which would be the ultimate mechanism that would allow them pattern completion, which stands on the basis of long-term memory. So I would argue that this mechanism activated by a single molecule, GLUR6, GLUR6, would be enough to take the brain and transfer it to a learning mode where the animals are smarter. And these are the people who've done the work throughout the years. It's a lot of work. It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of neurons, and these people have done it, and those are our partners throughout the world. And I thank you for your attention. Fast current does not change. You get the same threshold, you get the same spike up to the same spike width. It does not affect the early current. It does in other learning paradigms, but not in ours. Yeah. Would it be the same if, for example, you train the, if you train the rest on the uh, most the mesh before the... Uh, Actually, people have shown it. Yeah. People have shown it. Right. It's not what you'd call metaplasticity. Right. But metaplasticity is a large term. Um, uh, yeah, but it's basically learning, of learning how to learn. Right. I would argue that once you are learning something complex, you just become smarter. When I give this talk abroad, I tell them that I look at this data, I understand that the, the, the orthodox Jews were right. If you run Talmud, you'll just get smarter. So maybe the system works. You look for your environment. Right. 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 And again, one should remember, I think this is what Tali meant, these rats, they don't have really exciting lives. This water maze is for this maze for them is a whole ch change of world. Somebody who works on, on rats told me, try and grab a, a rat from the street and teach him and see if something changing in his brain. Probably not. So these are extreme conditions. There are extreme conditions, and I don't think it really happens in real life that all the neurons would suddenly fire 30% more spikes. But I think it does shed light on a mechanism which is actually there. The ability when you generate rules. You know it from your own experience. You solve equations in math. Most of us have no talent for that. So you just do one integral by the other, you do one by other, and suddenly there is a ha moment, right? Suddenly you got it. My students tell me that this is with this red, that you can see that suddenly you realize. It's all the average. I, I, I never show it because I, I have no way to quantify it. But they tell me, he didn't learn today, but he knows, he learned tomorrow. They suddenly, the whole behavior change. They sort of become more confident, and you can see that actually you realize what they have to do. So I guess it would serve you in the world if you're smarter. Is it not often found that learning one particular task competes a little bit with learning a bit different? Yes, if, if they overlap. You found that they essentially reinforce each other. Yeah, but, but you, you have to play with it to make them overlap. Actually, when I saw the psychologist, I said, of course, of course it does. You know, of course it happens. 
it's not peculiar to them at all. It's actually more biologists would, would be puzzled by that. To do this sort of interferencing, you have to do it just one second, bef you know, the two tasks one second before you let it consolidate, and they have to be somewhat similar. Y you, you can do that, but I don't think it would apply here. It's days and days before you try the second task. No, what I meant is, is when animals behave very naturally, when they are composed and more sensitive to a particular kind of task, and it's like attention switches to that. No, I don't think so. I, no. I think it's true for simple tasks. But if they spend the whole week there, <coughs> then they will respond totally different. I, I'm just guessing you're like you, but. I think it's hard to have a shot. It's not that clear. It is, but it's not that nice because uh, you get a change for a day or two or three, and the olfactory may remember for the first four days, <coughs> there's nothing really much. So they do improve, but not, not very nicely. You, you can see something. If you have enough rest and you quantify it enough, you, you'll see it. It's not, just not that nice. We never tried it. It's very hard to persuade them to run in the maze. You, you can't just take babies. They won't run. They have to be at least 200 grams. So I guess they were three, four weeks old, and then they'll do it. We're trying now to see if aged animals would learn slower. We assume they would, but we're doing it now. OK. Unfortunately, the, the whole technique of brain slices does not agree with humans. So uh, we just can't do the experiment. Uh, but would you, would you expect to see something similar with humans? I, mean, I tell you what I would expect. I would expect that QR6 would enhance cognition in humans. That's your, your question, right? This is, of course, the youth simplification. I don't know if you know, but if you have knockout mice in some molecule and they're not going to learn, their grandchildren are going to learn just fine. It's sort of a well-known thing that somehow the brain compensates if you take something of it. I'm sure this is not the only mechanism. I'm not saying that the R6 is the holy cred, not at all. But I would argue that you, can, you could enhance learning by activating the R6. And that it would happen by changing the intrinsic properties of the neurons. I would argue that. I wouldn't argue that this is the whole story, that the <coughs> degree of your intelligence is determined by the degree of activation of glor 6 But I would argue this is one mechanism that would be relevant to, let's say, if it's relevant to mice and rats, I would say that there's a good chance that it would be relevant to humans. By the way, there are two families in Iran which don't have the GLOR6 gene, and they have a high degree of retarded children. Again, I'm not sure that it's connected, but that's <coughs> what we know for now. We're now in the process of trying to develop a drug based on that. And if it would work on, we on, on uh, humans, it would be great, but we won't know before that. So thanks for coming.